Well, that was a good opening talking about what you got for Christmas, right? Um, you can see I have a picture here of what my house looked like the night before Christmas. Actually, this was a couple years ago, the night before Christmas. My in-laws had come, and so they brought lots of presents to put under the tree. So many they didn't fit under the tree. And you can see we had everything all just pretty right there. I had the nativity and the... Uh, fireplace and it was all lit up and the stockings are all sitting there all filled with things that Santa had brought and all the Christmas cards. Oh, it was so gorgeous. And then last night, my house looked like this. <laughs> so not so lit up. The Christmas cards have all fallen down. The stockings are all over the place. There's wrapping paper pieces, broken toys already. There were little tiny goldfish crackers that are yet on my living room floor. This is last night yet. So, but I'd say this is still joyful in my life. And isn't that the truth? There's so many places in our lives where there's a little bit of mess, but boy, the joy, you just can't, uh, you can't stand it, how happy you are, even in the mess. Um, I haven't had the experience myself of, of uh, having a baby, but I've been to the women's hospital, that fancy new one. <gasps> It must be all pretty every time, right? When people go and have babies, because when I walk in, it just looks beautiful <laughs> every time. And there's talk of the steak dinners, and there's so much joy. And when I see a, a new mom there, yeah, she looks a little tired, but boy, is she happy. And there's just a, a pretty little a pretty little baby that's all nice and cleaned up. So that's what I think <laughs> childbirth must be like, just beautiful. <laughs> well, but I did bring a baby home from the hospital, my son, and... Uh, Oh, after a couple weeks, you know, there was still that joy, but our, our house, when we had a little bitty baby, wasn't always smelling so good all the time with the diapers and the dishes that didn't get done and the extra food sitting out. And, and if I don't do something about this house <laughs> uh, next week, all those little crumbs that are on the floor, the little Christmas mice will come and start nibbling, and it won't be such a joyful mess, I don't think, come much longer. Well... We just came off of Christmas, and we'll have New Year's here, and the holidays, and all the family are together, and, and it's like that, isn't it? When we have all that joy that's surrounding us, and the parties, and the food, that anything else that's a little messy in life, or not so perfect, you kind of ignore all those things, and you can forget about the not-so-pretty things for a little while, because you're having so much fun, and you're having so much joy in your life. Now, in a couple weeks, though, all these decorations are going to come down. And we might come down a little bit. And reality is going to kick back in when we all have to go back to school and to work. And that's what I'd like to talk about today a little bit. This idea for us Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, we go through this as well, where there's those moments of just sheer joy in our faith in Jesus Christ. And then there's those moments where the reality kicks in of this world. And what is it? What does it mean when Jesus brings us real joy and real peace and peace that lasts? That's what I want to talk to us about today. Now, you may have come to believe in Jesus Christ as an adult for the first time, or you may have grown up like me in the church, and, and you might have had wonderful parents who told you about Jesus Christ. But in all of our faith journeys, I think we go through this stage of maturity. We should. It's biblical. It's scriptural that we would mature in our faith. We would, we would grow in our understanding of Jesus Christ. But at some point, even in that maturity, we experience that great joy, that you know, amazing grace song when you hear that moment you first believe, that amazing love that when you are sinning, when you make a mistake, when you are suffering, that's when God loves you so much he gave Jesus to die for you. And when that becomes real for you in your faith journey, it's amazing. And the sheer joy of that just overcompasses anything that might be a mess, anything that might be a sin, anything that might be ugly in your life because you have the joy of the Lord and it's awesome. I think of Mary and Joseph and their story, and we've heard that here um, leading up to Christmas that Mary is expecting a baby. It's not Joseph's. Joseph is going to divorce her quietly, but then an angel comes. Then they have to go to 
to Bethlehem and there's no place for them to stay. So then they stay in a stable and that's where Jesus, or Jesus is born in a barn, <laughs> literally. I mean, there's lots of messiness to this whole story. But at the same time, angels come to Mary and to Joseph and shepherds. And shepherds come and worship the newborn king. And then in a little while, these magi, these wise astrologers from a long ways away, they are going to travel and find this Christ child and bring him presents of gold and expensive perfumes. And, and Mary and Joseph know that their son, as they've been told, will be a king, will be the savior of the world. And so all that other messiness of being born in a barn, <laughs> of maybe not having everything you need, you know, I got to imagine that that just goes away in the sheer joy that God's son is in their midst. A king has been born and they are blessed. Scripture says Mary ponders all the things that the shepherds tell her in her heart. I mean, what an amazing joy this had to have been. And for us too in our walk with Jesus, that opportunity when we first feel that we are set free from our sins, in Jesus' name, just sheer joy. We have a word for this in... Uh, in the church. We like to call this these moments where you just have sheer joy in Jesus, these mountaintop experiences. It happens sometimes when our kids go off to camp and they, they experience that presence of the Holy Spirit. They experience maybe in a powerful way what Christ means to them. We call these things mountaintop experiences. It comes from scripture, from a time in the life of Jesus. There was this time when Jesus took Peter, James, and John. They go up to a mountaintop in Matthew 17, and this is where Jesus is transfigured. Which means, in Matthew 17, it says, Jesus' face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, this is great. <laughs> it's good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. This is great. God has come. There's Jesus. There's Moses. There's Elijah. They're on the top of the mountain. This is amazing. And Peter doesn't want this to end. He wants to set up some tents, some little shrines, some way that he can remember. He can come back and experience this moment many, many times over. This joy is something he wants to hold on to. He doesn't want to forget about. This is a mountaintop experience. What joy. And Peter didn't want to lose it. Maybe it was not so much about Jesus as it was about Peter and more about the feeling that he had right then and there. Matthew goes on um, very quickly. Matthew says that while Peter was still speaking all of his plans for building these tents and these shrines, uh, right away it says, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then as they had to do, coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. I imagine Peter would have <laughs> told everybody, this is a moment to brag about. I just saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to tell everybody about that? And you'd want to get all the glory of telling that story over and over and over again, but Jesus didn't want it to be about Peter and his story. Jesus says, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. It's to remain about Jesus. But yet sometimes when we get caught up in those mountaintop experiences in that sheer joy, it becomes more about us and that emotion. Jesus didn't want that to happen. He wanted it to be about Christ and what he would do for them. Sometimes when we start focusing so much on that joy, that Christmas joy, we share more about the joy, we share more about the prettiness and all the decorations and all the parties and the food than we do about the one who brings joy. And if we forget to share about why we are all gathering together, why we have such a peace at this time of year. And we start to turn it more about 
ourselves. We can see that. I mean, we just shared all the different things that we got for Christmas, right? It's so easy for us to share about ourselves and our blessings and all the good things that we have that it turns more inward and we forget about where our blessings come from. Now, this might seem like a little silly little story, but bear with me a second. Um, my son plays this goofy little game where um, he'll be playing with a puzzle or reading a book or he'll be doing something with his trains and all of a sudden he stops whatever he's doing and he says oh, tiger coming and then we have to play this tiger coming game and we have to save him from the tigers and whatever he was doing was totally forgotten because there's a tiger coming in west omaha obviously into our house there's a tiger coming well i have a solution for this tiger coming and it is this rock i have it right here see this rock keeps away tigers i tell you <laughs> you don't see any tigers here right this rock does it yeah when things are great when there are no tigers coming i can tell you anything <laughs> this rock keeps away tigers when we have so much joy in our lives when we have so many blessings and we stop remembering where those that joy and where those blessings come from we can start blaming it on all sorts of things then many religions can say, oh, I can solve your problems. I can give you happiness. You can have lots of different gods, lots of different beliefs, self-help books, Oprah, Dr. Oz. There's all sorts of ways out there that when life is going great, they say it's all because of me. I am the one that has brought to you these blessings. When we start focusing more on the joy and more on us receiving the joy and those presents and that feeling, then there's lots of places that those feelings can come from. Any tiger keeping away rock works when there's no tigers present. <laughs> When there isn't any pain, when there isn't any problems, when you're all up on that mountaintop, you can explain that joy in lots of different ways. But in a few more days, all these Christmas lights are coming down. In a few more days, more of our family members will be returning to their homes in Texas and Florida and the Southwest, all these different places. In a few more days, we're all going back to work and to school reality is going to be kicking in again and those messes that we were all able to ignore for a little while we're not going to be able to ignore so much longer we're going to go back to facing marriages that are rocky we're going to be we're going to have to face taxes here pretty soon we're going to have to face uh different decisions for your health care options and that's all over the place and confusing and crazy and some of us even I think way worse is starting to realize that some of the people we celebrated Christmas with this year, this might be the last year that we celebrate Christmas with them. Soon, you'll find that you're not so much on that mountaintop full of the joy of Christmas and feelings and happiness. But in a little bit, when February rolls around and it's still cold, and you're still facing sin and temptations. You might be in the valley. You might be in the mess, in the muck, in the sin. Mary and Joseph, after they were visited by the Magi, then it says that an angel of the Lord came to Joseph again and told them to flee for their lives. <laughs> that joy didn't last very long. <laughs> They'd just been given all these presents of gold and frankincense and more, and now they need to leave. Because Herod the king is looking for this baby. And King Herod is going to kill every baby born in and around Bethlehem. Just to make sure he can get this king that might possibly be a threat to King Herod's power on earth. So Mary and Joseph take Jesus, and where do they flee? They go to Egypt. Egypt. Egypt is where the Hebrews, the Jews, had been before in slavery. There is not a good history here for the Jews in Egypt. And this is where Mary and Joseph and Jesus go and hide for their lives to save Jesus. 
Talk about coming down from that mountaintop of experience of joy because here their son Jesus is supposed to be the son of God who will save the people. And they're hiding in Egypt of all places. A little while later, Jesus in John 16 tells us, I've told you all these things so that in me, in me, Jesus says, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Now there's more to that. You might know how the rest of that goes, but just think of this. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble peace of Jesus and trouble of this world and it's going to happen at the same time. Let's not forget that Jesus came not just to celebrate the joy of the season and, and peace, but Jesus came in the midst of our trouble. Jesus came for our valleys. Jesus came for our pain. It's not about the joy. It's about the one who brings us the joy. It's not about the peace of the holidays. It's about the one who brings us the peace. We cannot forget this because pretty soon it's going to be back to reality for us in our faith. And in our faith when we are faced with these valleys. It's not always joyful or peaceful. But that's when Jesus comes. In a few more days, when you experience this letdown of the holiday season, of Christmas, remember that it's not about all of these presents we receive today, but it's about a gift we have yet to come. It's about that heavenly glory through Jesus Christ. That's the gift that we are celebrating. And if uh, you don't know what gift I'm talking about yet, I have one more story to share with you about what I mean by the trouble in this world and the gift of God yet to come. When my husband and I lived in Minnesota, we lived there for about five years. We're both from Nebraska, but um, I went to the land of the Lutherans up there, and that's where I went to seminary, and, and uh, we lived there for five years. It's cold in Minnesota. And this is a family that in 2004 was in the news all over. They had f five boys, and, um, and they went to church, they, they were very involved. They, one morning in 2004, they all went to Sunday school. The one boy played in the worship band in the afternoon. Uh, three of the, the three oldest boys, they went to the store together. And later that night, the family had to say goodbye to those three older boys. Because while they were driving to the store and back, they were hit and killed by a drunk driver. And they weren't doing anything wrong. They had all their seatbelts on. They were obeying all the laws. Um, everything was fine. Church-going kids. <sighs> and yet sin and suffering and death came to their family. And just because they, they came to church, that didn't save them from the realities of this world that broke into their lives. This was all over the news. And, and it just kept going on TV and on the radio and in the media over and over again. And what you expect is the anger and you expect the litigation that would come afterwards. You expect all these negative feelings that came out of this senseless loss of life. There could be no joy in this. But all those feelings of negativity, that's not actually what kept coming out of the mom and the dad. Every time they would speak... And the media and even me, we kept looking for that, that anger, and, and we never quite saw it in the mom and the dad. And even today now, if you Google this story, and the mom and dad have a whole web page dedicated to the story and, and telling the, of what happened to their three boys. And, and still, here are some of their quotes. Their dad says, Would we lash out in anger and seek revenge, or would we humbly accept the new life that God has given us? My God has forgiven me. Can I do no less? That came from the dad. And another quote that the dad said, Justin, Jacob, and Matthew each had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and they are now in the presence of their Lord and Savior. The dad says, Our prayer is because of this, lives will be changed, and our God will be glorified. I don't think that these quotes were full of joy. But they were full of the one who brings joy. 
These quotes weren't full of peace, but they were full of the one who brings peace. They were full of the one who brings hope. They were full of the one who brings everlasting life. They were full of Jesus Christ. This family continues still to this day by their webpage, by speaking engagements. They continue to tell the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and that hope and assurance of living forever with your God in heaven because of what Jesus has done. Unfortunately, uh, for some weird reason, I was surprised to, to learn that they were Lutheran themselves. I don't know why that surprised me. <laughs> I mean, they live in the land of the Lutherans. Of course they would go to a Lutheran church. But what surprised me was that they were so good at continuing to share the love of Jesus and to share that why they, why they weren't erupting in all this anger and revenge was because they knew their sons were in heaven. They could say, my children have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and are with him in everlasting life. And they continue to share that message of joy. Many religions, self-help books, Dr. Oz, Oprah, lots of people can tell you, you know, ways that you can be saved for a little while. Healing things for today. Only Jesus Christ comes to us in our pain, in our suffering, with a gift that lasts, with salvation forever. Christ came when we're not pretty. Christ came when all the decorations are gone. Christ came in the valleys and in the troubles. Jesus said in Matthew 16, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And then Paul wrote, and we heard this today, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. Our joy is so much bigger than Christmas celebrations and all the family getting together and the, the temporary mountaintop joy experiences we have in this world. Our joy is so much bigger. Our peace is everlasting. The gift that we have been given is nothing of the gifts that we opened on Christmas morning. The gift we've been given is that assurance that in Jesus Christ we have been given life everlasting in his name. And so when we experience the messes again, when you are not so decorated up and looking pretty, when you are in the valleys come January and February, when you think everybody has left you, your God, Jesus Christ, has not. That is where he has come.